Good afternoon. I'm Violet Zariello, Marketing Manager at American Experience, PBS's flagship and longest running history series. Thank you for being here. Pass Forward, Conversations with American Experience is our monthly virtual series where we discuss the enduring themes explored in our films with historians and experts. Today's Pass Forward conversation will examine the history and effects of transgender representation in the media. It is inspired in part by our new documentary, Casa Susana, which is available to stream now on our website, the PBS app, and for a limited time on our YouTube channel. Casa Susana tells the story of a modest house in the Catskills region of New York that provided refuge for an underground network of transgender women and cross-dressing men in the 1950s and 60s. The house was a safe space to express their true selves, to dress and live as women without fear of being incarcerated or institutionalized for their gender expression. Today, our guests will discuss the origins and legacy of gender nonconformity in film, television, and other media, and the effects media representations have on public consciousness. As always, this is meant to be an interactive conversation. I invite you to write questions in the live chat, and we'll answer as many as possible during the discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our corporate sponsor, Liberty Mutual Insurance. I'd also like to acknowledge the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, members of the Better Angel Society, including the Fullerton Family Charitable Fund and Philip I. Kent through the Philip I. Kent Charitable Fund, the Brian A. McCarthy Foundation, and Angoa and Percy Rep, Societe des Productors, the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation, the Documentary Investment Group, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, PBS, our home station GBH, and of course, viewers like you. Now it's my privilege to introduce our panel for this conversation. Sam Fader is the Peabody Award nominated director and co-producer of the groundbreaking Netflix original documentary, Disclosure. He has written for numerous Netflix television productions and is currently developing the queer drama series, Weimar, with executive producers Lily Wachowski and Bruce Cohen about trans life in Berlin during the Weimar Republic. Laura Horak is an associate professor of film studies at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. She also serves as the director of the Transgender Media Lab and Transgender Media Portal. The conversation will be moderated by Raquel Willis, an award-winning activist, author, and media strategist whose work is focused on Black transgender liberation. She has served as Director of Communications for Ms. Foundation for Women, Executive Editor of Out Magazine, and National Organizer for the Transgender Law Center. Thank you again, and please enjoy the conversation. <laughs> mm. Raquel, can you hear me? Raquel, can you hear anyone speaking? Okay, there's, did you unmute the bottom green microphone on the bottom? Okay, it may be something on the back end, engineer. Should 
Should we all jump back in, perhaps? Yeah, maybe Raquel, you should leave and come back. Sometimes that helps. Our moderator is leaving the premises. Hello, hello. Yes. Hey. Hello. <laughs> I have no idea what happened. Good job. Congratulations, well, you're back. Look, it's so good to hear your analogy. voice. <laughs> um, so welcome to today's episode of Trans People in Tech. I'm your, no, I'm just kidding. Um, well, <laughs> thank you to our audience and of course to our panelists for uh, rolling with these technical difficulties. What I was saying was thank you so much to Violet for that warm introduction. And of course, welcome to Sam and Laura. Um, it's an honor to speak with you all today about the role that media narratives play in shaping popular perceptions of transness and of course the lives of trans people. So we're gonna start with some framing for the audience. Um, simply put, and this is to both of our lovely panelists, why is it important to tell and preserve trans stories? Um, I can jump in and I think uh, this is definitely much more of a Laura question, the, the preservation of. Um, I think, you know, for anyone, we need to see ourselves. I mean, media is the most influential cultural product of our time. Um, so when you're one of the few that is relegated to the margins and not seeing yourself, that, you know, has consequences. Um, I think, you know, we uh, need to it's important to tell the stories because that's how tradition, you know, evolves and continues. Um, and that's how we share. And also being able to see ourselves documenting our lives is, is an important, I think it's an important psychological factor in understanding your past and in a mediated culture, I think, you know, telling stories through moving image is really powerful. Um, you want to talk about preservation, Laura? Sure. Yeah. I completely agree with Sam. I mean, media, helps us understand what's possible and what the world was like, what it will be like, what it could be like. And so if some people are systematically excluded from media or just presented in very limited ways, it, it cuts them off from their history and it cuts people off from each other. Um, when trans people are telling trans stories, we find that they're so much more diverse. Trans people have been here forever doing all kinds of things. And there's all kinds of ways to tell those stories. And um, one thing that's really common is that trans people have actually been making movies for decades, but they're really hard to find. And so uh, trans artists, trans youth, trans activists, uh, trans journalists get cut off from their own histories and from this tradition of making work. So that's why it's important, not just for trans people today to tell trans stories, but for us to remember and connect to the trans stories that have been told for many, many years. Yes. Well, of course, we are using um, the film Casa Susana as a jumping off point for our discussion today. Um, and of course, that tells of a historic period um, within kind of a history of shared gender nonconformity across various identities. Um, and one of those public trans figures mentioned in the film is Christine Jorgensen. And so if you're in community, probably regardless of your generation, you have some idea of who Jorgensen was. She was a trans woman who was very sensationalized by the press after she transitioned or started her uh, medical transition in 1952. Then she went on to have a career in cabaret and stage shows. And so that idea of visibility, you know, she kind of capitalized on that idea of spectacle as well. Um, and of course, in order to gain uh, what she called legitimacy in the public eye, she often emulated this kind of uh, what, what many people think of traditional idea of a white middle class womanhood during her time. And of course, this influenced a lot of uh, the trajectories of trans people for generations. So we're going to take a second and look at this clip uh, from Casa Susana. Mr. 
Christine Jorgensen, who used to answer to George, creates quite a stir as she returns home to New York from Copenhagen. Christine hit the headlines following the series of operations in Denmark that transformed her from a boy into a girl, all of which made her a celebrity to meet and talk to when she stepped off the plane at International Airport. Gentlemen, please give her a chance to talk. I'm very impressed by everyone coming. Christine, are you happy to be home? Yes, of course. What American wouldn't be? Have you been offered a movie contract? Yes, but I haven't accepted it. Do you, uh, do you have any plans regarding the theater? No, I don't think so. And Christine! Uh, are you going to go on with your photography? I hope so, yes. I see. Right. Uh, I'm okay, very happy quiet. to be back, and I don't have any plans at the moment. And I thank you all for coming, but I think it's too much. Fine, thank you very much. I was a paper boy, and I carried the paper. And when I went down to pick up the papers, there was Christine Jorgensen on the front page. And I think I sat down and I read the story. I read it avidly. And that was it. There was nobody I could talk to about it. If I were to talk to about it, oh, this is horrible. There'd be that, you know, this horrible, sinful thing that this person did to themselves and they will be damned to hell, and all my friends would just make fun of it. Talking to my parents would be a disaster. It was illegal in this country, so almost everybody in the country thought it was wrong. All the doctors thought it was wrong. It was all wrong. It was just barely beginning to be contemplated as something that was plausible, might be conceivable. Okay, so you just saw a clip from Casa Susana, which explores uh, really the impact that Christine Jorgensen had on this particular uh, person uh, featured in the film. So I, I want to start with you, um, Lauren, just kind of talk about um, these narratives around transition. We know that trans people in particular and those who kind of follow uh, our narratives have been kind of plagued with this idea that transition be captured even, right? And, and particularly that it be captured in a particular way. Can we break down here? Um, and then Sam, maybe you can weigh in afterwards about the impact that the emphasis on transition has on maybe reinforcing or in, maybe in some cases dismantling gender norms. Yeah, well, we certainly know that people have lived as different genders from the ones that were assigned to them at birth forever, you know, and long before there was any kind of particular um, medical treatments uh, involved. And so it was only in the 20th century that the medical industrial complex got involved in helping kind of come up with certain names and labels and rules for you know who as was going to be as they called it at the time transsexual who was allowed and they were very strict about it and very conservative and so it was only people like Christine Jorgensen who was a middle class uh, white law law abiding citizen who promised to become a straight kind of traditional woman when uh, she transitioned. And so those kinds of rules that the medical establishment put in place have, have been really strong and have gone on for many years and in some cases are still put in place where only certain people are believed by doctors and doctors feel that it's their role to determine who is really trans or not. And I think we can see that um, starting already in the 50s and C. Riley Snorton and Emily Skidmore, um, historians, trans historians, have pointed out that Jorgensen was only one of many trans women who was in the news at the time. There was black, Latina, Asian women, uh, but they didn't get the same kind of coverage as Christine did. They didn't get the same kind of health care, uh, the same kind of job opportunities. So, um, at the same time, Christine's story was very empowering for people in uh, 
Susan Stryker's film, Screaming Queens, uh, some of the queens from uh, San Francisco Tenderline talked about um, how much hope they had when they learned that there was ways to change their body to be in line with how they um, how they wanted to live and how they wanted to be perceived. So uh, the, the Christine narrative was so powerful, both in good ways and that it gave people hope to, to live their lives in new ways. Um, and also uh, it excluded many different people's experiences. It was the beginning of a period in which, you know, white powerful men got to decide on the circumstances of trans people's lives, which is the period we're still really in. Yeah, I mean, I echo everything Laura said and the emphasis on how race and class impact the, these histories and how things are interpreted and understood and established. And the, the pressure question um, makes me think about, yes, there was the medical establishment decided on the rules. You know, they were not trans people, but they decided on the new rules for trans people. And very quickly, trans people played the game. So we actually don't know mm -hmm. how people identified really in their hearts. We don't really know what Christine, how she saw herself. I've definitely heard some stories that are not part of the popular discourse. Um, you know, there's this clip I saw when I was doing research for Disclosure where Christine Jorgensen was on the Dick Havitt show and he asked her about the change, about surgery, and she stood up and walked off. She just walked away. She left on live television. And that is the only clip that is not available on the website of that show. So, that, I mean, that just speaks volumes, right, around her personality and things we weren't allowed to see about her. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question because it's also, there's, there, it's a problematic question, and I know you know this, Raquel, it's a problematic question because it's under the assumption that maybe trans people don't want to be binary, right? And it's like mm -hmm. trans people are choosing their gender in the same way that non-trans people are. And you know, I think there is no monolithic, as we know, there is no monolithic trans desire. And so I think these are tricky questions to answer because they, they're so nuanced and to, to reduce someone's desire, right, to one idea is just erasing so many other people. I think about the third thing that this makes me think about is in particular for trans women, the inherent misogyny in these ideas. I, I remember when I first started making films about trans people and I had a lot of wonderful feminists in my life, but they were a little misguided in their understanding of trans women in particular. And they often would talk about this reinforcing of femininity and that it, that is so deeply misogynistic in every way you look at it, right? Like what is wrong with femininity? What is wrong with a woman wanting to be feminine? Like just the, the layers upon the, 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 the layers upon the entitlement to ask sex questions, like just gives you a window into the othering that trans people have just constantly been, been placed in. Absolutely. Thank you both for those answers, Sam. You, you really got me thinking about, um, you know, how, how much in feminist spaces, at least in the last, I would say about 10 years, you know, there's been a lot of discussion around choice feminism, right? That there is this kind of expanded idea of what we think about uh, what womanhood can mean. But that often has been an idea or a concept open, usually only to cis women, right? And, and often to straight women. So it's so interesting that you bring up that, that conversation because it's, so many of these discussions are contextualized differently for trans people in ways that they shouldn't be necessarily. Um, so I, I want to jump now um, into something actually, Sam, that is explored uh, pretty extensively in Disclosure, just talking about um, kind of uh, the history and, and early portrayals of transness or gender nonconformity um, around these ideas uh, being comic in nature, like ultimately only comedy oftentimes particularly thinking about vaudeville and, and cabaret depiction. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that history, particularly within American media that's explored in Disclosure? Yeah, I think, you know, that history, I think it's a really interesting history when I was first doing research and seeing how the 
the interpretations of these symbols changed over time, right? So first in the early part of film with pre-talkies and you see some of those clips in Disclosure, um, you know, a man in a dress was just an absurd woman, right? It was just about w womanhood, femininity, right? And the absurdities around that presentation and those actions. Um, and then a man in a dress was a stand-in for a gay man and the absurdity around the gay man, right? And then eventually we have cis actors in a dress, you know, standing in for trans women. So that, so that was really interesting to me to see how the meaning changed over time. Um, I'm, I'm a little stuck on something in the last question that I wanted to, I'm trying to find a way to connect the two, but I'm not succeeding right now. But I did want to talk about how this idea of singling out trans women um, to, to say that this reinforcing of patriarchy um, has also just bothered me so intensely because it's really, it's so reductive to what the toxicity in patriarchy is, right? The toxicity is in our actions, right? It's in how we treat each other. It's not what we wear. And I think media has really led us to believe that our ideologies are based on what we wear and how we look. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, we're never gonna solve and address any of these problems if we're constantly reducing it to those ideas of caricature. So I did connect it to your question. You did. <laughs> yes. And, and Laura, just kind of jumping off from what Sam just shared, um, of course, in your scholarship, particularly around uh, transness and film and TV and, and so many other media, um, you've discussed different patterns. So I wonder, and I, I know Sam already touched on a few, but are there other, you know, tropes uh, or assumptions and some of those covered some of that coverage um, that you would add to this discussion that maybe we haven't talked about so far? Sure, there's some tropes that really have gone away and so people don't even know about them. In the very earliest cinema, there was all kinds of women playing male roles. There was women characters cross-dressing and they were heroes. They were action heroes, they were doing stunts, they were dramatic heroes. There, and this whole history has been largely forgotten. At the time, most, most actresses in Hollywood were playing at least one or two boy roles or cross-dress roles a year. It was so popular and it wasn't seen as something, um, you know, pathological or, or even uh, laughable. And in early cinema, in some places like China and India and Japan, they also had male performers playing female roles, not because they were funny, but because they thought they could embody the ideal of womanhood uh, better as performers. Now, I don't know, you know, I'm not a critic here, but um, so it's so interesting that who is allowed to play what and who and what it's imagined to mean was very different 100 years ago, 120 years ago than it was today. Although there is that, that through line of comedy that, um, that Sam mentioned and that was also on theater and um, all kinds of longstanding traditions. But I would argue that cross-dressing comedies are kind of complicated. You know, um, are we laughing at the person because we think they're silly or are we kind of imagining their freedom and laughing because they have this kind of joyous anarchy? You know, are we celebrating the way they overturn all of the rules or are we happy when at the very end of the film, all the rules go back in place and gender is restored? And so I think that um, for many years, cross-dressing comedies were a place that trans and gender non-conforming people uh, could, they could, they could go together to the movies and watch these and kind of see them in different ways than what some of the people sitting next to them might have been seeing. But I do think that being said, that there's a way in which the sorts of gender non-conforming trans cross-dressing roles got sort of smaller and smaller as uh, film history went on. And so uh, it did start to be more pathologized. It did start to be more the butt of the joke. And um, Julia Serrano, um, a great trans writer, talks about these two common tropes that I think are persistent throughout all of film history of what she calls the, the pathetic um, trans person where we're meant to either feel sorry for them or to laugh at them or um, the deceptive trans person who is meant to be a threat to us because we, we can't tell what their, what their gender really is. And I think 
both of those tropes you see in many different genres, and they both rely on the idea that trans people's genders are not real and that we shouldn't believe them. Um, and so I think you can still see that in some movies today, although sometimes we see more, um, more of the pathetic trans person uh, because that's meant to be more sympathetic, you know, that they're a, a figure of, of tragedy. But I think as, um, as Sam's work and as your work shows, there's, there's many other ways of depicting trans lives and um, trans, trans creative work, trans political work. Um, and so those have been shown in independent trans cinema, in web series, in writing, um, but in mainstream cinema and film, I mean, in television, the, 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 it's been kept very, very narrow into these, uh, these two tropes. Can I add one thing onto that? Um, so let, just like what Laura was saying of that all these tropes that are, they're all, they all boil down to one thing, right? Saying that we're not who we say we are, whether it's being deceptive, being pathetic, being, a, being you know, or, or we deserve to not be in public space, right? So if you're criminalizing us, institutionalizing us, all of these say the same thing. The psychotic killer, right? The and then there, I've noticed an interesting thing with casting historically is that when the idea is that that the character is pathetic, they cast a cis man. When the idea that the character is deceptive, they cast a cis woman. I, I found mm -hmm. that really interesting in the way the stories are framed and told, and it makes me think a lot about. Um, like the work you do, Raquel, in journalism and the, the echo chamber between the stories we see in Hollywood and the way media, like news media, reports on our lives. Like, is that, do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, I, just listening to both of you, I, I mean, these conversations are always just a reminder of how deep um, the, I guess, the valley is for trans folks to not only be represented authentically and, and with vulnerability, but also to do that on our own, right? To, to have the agency and the power to do that ourselves, because for so long we have been locked out of that as well. Um, but I, I think these tropes around being deceptive, right? Not being who we say we are, we see that seep into every part of our lives. You know, we see it, of course, in the political landscape where so many of these over 600 pieces of anti-LGBTQ uh, mm -hmm. plus legislation introduced this year, many of them are targeting trans people specifically, right? And, and trans youth in particular too, and saying, and, and they're all kind of hinging right on this idea that trans youth don't know who they are. Some of them are also curtailing the rights of trans adults as well to access things like medical care and saying, we don't even know who we are. So um, I, I think the work that you both are doing in, in kind of illuminating this history of these tropes really gets us to understand the roots of some of this hate and, and gives us an opportunity to chip away at it. Because if you don't know the history, you're going to think that the transphobia or the trans misogyny is like air and honestly it's not it's it's man-made so to speak it's so man-made and if you don't know the history you you think oh that's an interesting point when someone says you know that somehow we're not real and then you know the the power of of mainstream press and the fact that they're you know new york times articles are used in these mm -hmm. litigation cases you know to take away our health care. I mean, that's that's deep, right? They bring the paper of record into the courtroom to argue that we're not real. Like, where do those, where did that idea come from? And how does that become acceptable? Absolutely. Okay, so we're gonna keep moving, but I'm sure that we'll, we'll come back to this thread um, because we're, we're gonna play a clip uh, from Disclosure, of course. Um, so we're gonna get a better sense of the changing landscape of trans representation and the impact that media has had on the lives of trans people and continues to have on the lives of trans people. Um, so here's a clip from Sam's groundbreaking documentary film, Disclosure. Do you know that feeling when you're sitting in a movie theater and everyone's laughing at something and you just don't get it? Can't find a better man. 
hate everyone else in the world but you. I never thought I'd live in a world where trans people would be celebrated on or off the screen. Thank you, thank you so much for this moment. I never thought the media would stop asking horrible questions. How do you hide your peanuts? <laughs> and start treating us with respect. You kept it quiet because you said you didn't want to become othered. Now, look how far we've come. We have so much more representation in government, in media. We are everywhere. And you never know what those positive images do for other people. You never know. For the first time, trans people are taking center of their own storytelling. At this point, where we're talking really about unprecedented trans visibility. That's my sister! Look at me! Trans people are being murdered disproportionately still. That's the paradox of our representation is the more we are seen, the more we are violated. The more positive representation there is, the more confidence the community gains, which then puts us in more danger. I go into the women's restroom, then I've committed a crime. If I go in the men's restroom, then everybody knows I think all of us in the community have had those moments of being like, is this going to somehow alienate people who aren't ready yet? Why is it that trans issues have become like a front and center issue in the culture wars? I think capitalizing on people's fear is what has landed us in this moment right now. And you have hope on one side and fear on the other. I think for a very long time, the ways in which trans people have been represented on screen have suggested that we're not real, have suggested that we're mentally ill, that we don't exist. And yet, here I am, yet here we are, and we've always been here. All right, I hope everyone uh, is acknowledging all of the tingles that I'm sure they are feeling. Um, every time I see that uh, trailer, I, I always get that feeling. And of course, watch Disclosure. Um, I want to take a quick second before we continue, just to remind our audience, all of our viewers, if you have questions, please send them to us. We are going to start including some of those questions um, along the way as we um, go into the second half of this discussion. Um, so I, I want to shift a little bit maybe from our existing question, Sam, and, and ask you. So Disclosure uh, was really a, a, and is really a seismic film exploring the portrayals of trans um, folks throughout time. And I'm wondering, can you share a bit about the impact that you've seen or witnessed um, in the aftermath of, of Disclosure uh, being shared with the world? Thank you for asking that question. Um, it's not enough. The impact hasn't been great enough. Um, the impact I've seen you know, it, it's different in industry to industry. You know, I think it's a lot more people are displaying their pronouns and, you know, HR may be a little more uh, knowledgeable. Um, maybe people are doing a little more outreach, uh, but in, in Hollywood, it, very little has changed. Um, yeah. the, the scripts that get sent to me <laughs> like have all the tropes that we try to deconstruct and, and disclosure, so it's a little shocking. Um, but I think the biggest change is now there. There's there's a, a given conversation that a lot of people can partake in. There's a, a common language and a common experience of watching the film and and then being able to kind of ping pong about how that affects people's present. Right. So when we first when it first was released, it was amazingly heartening to see you know A list celebrities. Um, 
talk about how you know they'll they'll watch everything differently or or apologize for something they were in which actually always broke my heart because i'd never blame the actors for taking a job um, but to start to see an accountability around this history was really interesting um, and at least now a lot of people know that there's a lot they don't know right so this is i think that we're seeing that change um, but as everything else i'm sure as you both know it all comes down to money right so it's like if a bad script has a team that thinks it's going to sell it, it's, it's supported, you know, and I've seen that now being more on the inside of this, I just see it again and again and again. And if I don't give them the, the stamp of approval, they're going to go to someone else to try to find that stamp of approval. So it's tricky. Um, I think, you know, in making disclosure, the motivation is so much in what you see in that first clip, you know, around the paradox of visibility and, understanding and trying to understand how you can celebrate both this increased visibility, which every human being needs, but the impending backlash that will ensue, right? Anytime a marginalized community is put in the spotlight, there's always backlash. So how can we prepare for that? And I really was really, really interested in that conversation. And the end of the film circles back to that. And, and Susan Stryker actually talks about how things can spin on a dime and like, we shouldn't be complacent. And this is just one piece of the pie. The revolution is not over. And obviously we're seeing that right now. And I just really wonder, you know, in 2014, 2015, when you know, the, the whole transgender tipping point was becoming a conversation, what would now look like had we been having these more complicated conversations about visibility? Um, so, you know, everything, everything is contextual. So you asking me, if you had asked me this question two years ago, I might've been a lot more positive about the impact and the feedback, but I'm so demoralized. I'm so demoralized with the state of affairs right now. Um, so that's the lens in which I am answering the question. I hear you. Yeah. I, I, it, it's so real. I mean, it seems like things kind of hit an uptick and, you know, there was kind of a, a riding on, on this excitement and joy in some ways of trans visibility. And of course, you know, I think some of us know that a little bit of that is its own media narrative or has been, right? The, the trans visibility um, kind of idea that, oh, we've arrived. And there, there's this idea that when you arrive, that's it, right? You've reached the pinnacle and, and you're done. And, and of course, like you're saying, Sam, there is oftentimes that backlash to the visibility piece. Um, but I, I do want to name, I, I think, uh, disclosure, and of course, the work that you continue to do is an intervention, right? And it is a solution, um, even when it seems like these wildfires around us are the highest. And so is your work, Laura. Um, so I, I do want to take a chance um, to also talk about some of the other work that you do, particularly as the director of the Transgender Media Lab and the Transgender Media Portal. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that work and that intervention that you also work on, as well as, of course, your illustrious career in, in uh, the field of academia? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so uh, as we've been talking about, trans people have actually been making media for decades. And the problem is it's often hard to find or it's not being preserved or you, know, you can hear about it, but you don't know how to get a hold of it. And so this is the problem that the transgender media portal, which my lab is collectively building, uh, is set out to solve. So it's something like IMDb, but for trans filmmakers and their works, the idea is that you'll be able to search and browse and find thousands, tens of thousands of films and uh, web series and things made by trans people uh, from all different time periods, all different genres. Uh, we're still doing the research now and building the tool. We're hoping to launch it in about a year, but we do already on our website have a list of black, indigenous and other people of color trans filmmakers, probably about 60 or 70. So if any uh, film festival programmer or instructor says, oh, I can't I can't find a film. I can't think of a, a director. You know, let's just show, um, you know, boys don't cry again. Um, which often is, stands in for like all of trans film history, you know, um, at least in academia it does. Um, so they'll be able to go to this website and, and there's no excuse for not finding the wide variety of amazing works that trans people have, um, have created. And um, the other things that I've been doing research on 
I'm writing a book right now about this um, history of trans filmmaking in the last 30 years, all the different topics that trans people have taken on, all the different approaches from experimental, documentary, comedies, romantic comedies, uh, dramas. So uh, as, as we've talked about, the mainstream media so often just shows trans in like one or two different ways, but trans people, hundreds, thousands of them have already done the work of telling the stories. We just have to watch them and hire them and screen them. Um, certainly, you know, Sam's whole career um, has been uh, as part of this really exciting community of, um, of trans filmmaking that's existed at the margins of the industry and is now starting to take up space in the mainstream industry. Uh, the other thing I want to say that was related to um, Sam's reflections on disclosure and on this you know, terrible time we're living in of extreme political backlash and violence towards trans people uh, this something similar happened also in the 1920s and 30s when the U.S. Uh, mainstream film industry decided that lesbians were a new chic thing, that now they were going to include lesbian characters. They were going to name, use the word lesbian in newspapers to describe them. They were going to describe to the newspaper viewers, you know, what a lesbian looks like, where to find them. You can go to Greenwich Village, you know. So it was part of this media wanting to exploit the public fascination with something new, something different, something kind of dangerous, um, which was on the one hand wonderful for lesbians and that all of a sudden they knew they were not alone. They knew how to find them. We, they knew where to go. They knew how to dress if they wanted to be recognizable. But at the same time, it launches this backlash, a conservative backlash. Um, then we also we get the uh, Hayes Production Code that started to much more mm -hmm. strictly um, censor films. And so this similar kind of um, movement of, of kind of visibility and recognition that's important for creating community, um, but that also is uh, makes people vulnerable to be um, to be discriminated against, to have harm done to them because they also become recognizable in a new way to, um, to the broader public. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes, that, that history of the Hayes Code. I mean, so many folks uh, don't know that history, right? The average person probably doesn't know that there's just been this long history of waves of regulation and deregulation and visibility and invisibility. Um, so thank you for speaking to those cycles. Um, and again, for the work that you're doing. Um, we did get a question from the audience um, that asked about some of the creators that are kind of responsible for um, or trying to answer the call to be a force for good and sharing trans narratives right now. But um, Laura, you just shared um, that you have a wealth of resources on the transgendermediaportal.org, um, so folks can re look there. I see the phenomenal BIPOC trans filmmakers list, and and kudos to your team for um, also just including various types of media, right? So, of course, we have feature filmmakers, but of course, people are doing. Um, short and long form on social media even, right? And using video there. And so you kind of have this mixture. Um, so I, I want to take a second though and not, and not completely uh, bypass that question. If maybe we can have just like a quick kind of rapid fire of uh, some of the work um, by trans creators that's speaking to both of you right now. Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot and you both have like encyclopedic uh, frames, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, maybe what's speaking to you right now, and I can start. Um, actually, I, I do want to lift up, um, this is actually a book um, by Trayvell Anderson, who uh, just recently dropped We See Each Other, which is exploring Black trans um, media portrayals um, throughout time, particularly in TV and film. So if you want to know more about that history, uh, look into that book as well. Um, there are also a number of uh, documentaries that are coming out right now. Um, alongside, of course, Casa Susana, we have The Stroll, which is a really powerful exploration of um, uh, particularly Black trans sex workers in the meatpacking district in uh, New York, really from about 
really over the course of several decades, I would say. Um, we also have Kokomo City that's coming out soon by uh, D. Smith. I have to give my shout outs uh, to my Southern folks too. Um, and there's a lot. I, I'm missing one right now because there's so many. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that jogs y'all's uh, thoughts right now. Well, you stole all mine. So <laughs> I'm actually seeing Kokomo City Sunday. I haven't seen it yet. It's playing here at Outfest. So I'm <sighs> very excited about it. Um, another feature film that came out, which I have a lot of thoughts about, but I do think people, I think it's a beautiful film. It's called Mutt. It's a, it's a scripted mm. piece um, made by a trans guy, a lot of trans people in it. It, it. What I think it does really beautifully that I haven't seen before is the trans person does not leave their history behind, um, in particular, anything that might signal femininity or womanhood or girlhood. And I thought that it did a really beautiful job of that because I think we struggle with that. Like, oh, what can we show? What can we reveal? Is that gonna you know, you know, impact the way we want people to see us. And so I really loved, I loved, loved that in my, um, I'll pause and, and see if Laura has stuff while I think more. Also, this question is just so hard because so many of my friends make incredible work and I just feel like I'm going to leave someone out in some capacity, but Laura, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. There is so much great stuff. Um, Isabel Sandoval is uh, someone I adore. Her feature film, Lingua Franca, is available on Netflix, and it is just completely arresting. Like, give yourself some time afterwards to recover. Um, I still love Her Story, which is a fun romantic comedy web series that um, Sydney Freeland directed. Um, TJ Cuthand is a really amazing two-spirit uh, trans man uh, artist who's done a ton of short films, including... Uh, a really creative one that's available for free online called Woman Dress. Um, and then also River Gallo is a favorite. Um, uh, River is a trans intersex person who made a short film called Pony Boy that's just really beautiful. And I'm really excited to see where River goes next. So there's both like people who have been around for decades. There's people who are just starting out. I mean, one of the great things about Sam's movie was that you made room for trans people in all of the behind the scenes position. And so I feel like there's a whole generation of people involved in your film that are now kind of spreading their wings and showing all kinds of great stuff that they've done um, that they're starting to do. So that is really, really thrilling to see. Thanks for saying that, Laura. I think that might be the thing I'm most proud of, of, of all everything that happened with Disclosure. I love it. I love it. Oh, this is so beautiful. Okay. See how we light up when we just kind of gush about our people um, and the folks who are moving such important work. Um, so we are coming close to the end. Um, I, we probably only have about time for about one or two more questions. Um, so I want to jump to um, really a question about um, your hopes for the future of trans narratives and media um, moving forward. You know, I know we've talked a lot about some of the pitfalls, the struggles along the way, but, you know, what are your hopes that um, uh, tra for trans narratives and the media um, moving forward? And Laura, if you want to start. I can start. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I have one off the top is like, we have to have trans and black and indigenous people of color, trans people at the top, you know, as the executives who make the decisions, as the ones who decide who the audiences are they want to reach, because uh, it's exciting to see so many trans people, um, you know, entering the business. But if they still have to sort of work with the same old scripts or the same old kind of arguments about who the audience is or what a film should be like, then they kind of get hemmed in. And of course, people working in independent media have more freedom in some sense, but a lot less money and a lot less distribution power. And so they can make amazing films. And then, you know, that trans youth in Omaha or wherever is not going to see it because it's not going to be advertised there. Right. So I think that it's clear that we're just at the beginning of what, what we need to see to have um, a film industry, and not just for trans people, for all kinds of marginalized people. Um, a, a, an industry that really kind of 
is led by the hopes and dreams and imaginations of the broad swath of of the public and not just a small community that's used to seeing itself over and over and over. I mean, Laura really touched on everything. I, it, the idea that nothing will change until trans people are in more decision-making positions. Like things are just not gonna change. It'll be a temporary yeah. change, um, but the people in decision-making positions, they get to decide what is right and what they believe is good and what stories to tell. Um, so it doesn't matter how many people are a PA, you know, it's great, they get, they're getting paid, um, but yeah, that you have to change it from the top. Um, also though, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm doing a follow-up to Disclosure um, where it's sort of the same approach, but towards journalism. And so I'm really looking mm. at that now, how, you know, how have, why have things changed so quickly, right? Why are the stories that we're seeing now and the framing that we're seeing now, how did that happen? When did, you know, I mean, it getting, makes me think of Susan Stryker's quotes that, you know, things can spin, spin on a dime. So like when, what was that moment when it became more popular and more exciting and editors wanted to publish more of these degrading articles? Um, so I feel like there is a direct dialogue between Hollywood and the press. There's a direct dialogue between Hollywood and politics. All of these things are in constant conversation. Um, and so it, it has to be taken, it has to be taken seriously in terms of the life and death consequences that they all have the power of. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, Sam, just, just hearing you talk about um, journalism and, and that in, the industry is just, yeah, you know, I've been in spaces that, you know, on the surface looked liberatory, right, that were <laughs> queer and trans and, and all of these different things. And still, you know, even folks who dedicate their lives to shifting and changing um, the narratives around transness, you know, our people get ground up, you know, especially if you're any kind mm -hmm. of marginalized, you know, you can have the, the best um, lens and intentions, if that's even possible, and, and still kind of just be at the whim of, you know, particularly capitalistic forces, right, that yeah. will try and silence you in so many ways. We see it of course, right now, um, probably strongest with Hollywood and the writer strikes, right? So many folks who are trans creators, mm -hmm. some actually on, on your list um, of BIPOC filmmakers, uh, Laura, <laughs> for the transgender uh, media portal um, are striking, right? Because they need um, support. So I, I know we have like two minutes left. Um, so I just wanna take a chance just to suggest that Folks just pour their energy into the work of trans folks, you know, the authors, the filmmakers, the, the historians, the, and the people who have the track record of showing up for our community as well. Um, and I just want to thank you both for having such a rich discussion today. Um, yeah, and just, just being really present and vulnerable with all of this, because I know we're, we're living in a often difficult time. So thank you. Thank you, Raquel. There's so many more questions I have for you, but I'll, I'll follow up on that. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to, of course, of course. Thank you. And now we'll pass it back to Violet for closing remarks. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation, examining the history and effects of transgender representation in the media. Casa Susana is available to stream now on our website, the PBS app, and for a limited time on our YouTube channel. You can watch our past forward conversations anytime on our YouTube channel or on our website. And if you liked what you saw today, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and sign up for our events newsletter. You'll be the first to know about new conversations, opportunities to watch new films live with us, and more. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great evening.